Welcome to the program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear a report from Dan Friedel about climate change and Hollywood. Faith Perlo answers a question from an English learner. We close with an American story. This week, it is part two of Rappaccini's Daughter. But first... Activists held a series of climate change protests for Earth Day on Friday. The group's demands included an immediate halt to European imports of Russian oil and gas and an end to building infrastructure that requires fossil fuel use. Activists in major cities across Europe gathered outside German government or embassy buildings. Germany is one of several European Union members that opposes a ban or embargo on Russian oil and gas imports. Leaders fear such restrictions would damage their national economies. The demonstrators handed out Russian money that had been marked with red to represent blood. The activists say the oil and gas purchases from Russia fuel climate change and support Russia's war in Ukraine. A small group of demonstrators gathered in the western Ukrainian city of Lviv, which was hit by Russian missiles earlier this week. Several people were killed in the strikes. Natalia Gozak, chief of the group EcoAction, was among the activists in Lviv. She said, When Germany continues buying gas and oil from Russia, it means that they are paying their money to construct new military machines, new bombs, which are killing Ukrainians. Gozak said politicians must choose between possible economic harm and continued killings of Ukrainians. In the United States, activists protested in Washington, D.C., The protesters demanded climate action on Earth Day, April 22nd, when people worldwide celebrate the planet and work together to improve its health. The worldwide protests come three weeks after a United Nations climate report warned there is little time left for reducing greenhouse gas emissions enough to prevent the worst effects of climate change. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February, the European Union has spent more than $41.2 billion on Russian fossil fuel imports. The EU's 27 countries have agreed to ban Russian coal imports beginning in August. Countries including Italy and Germany have said they can stop depending on Russian gas within a few years. Some European companies are already rejecting Russian oil voluntarily to avoid public criticism or possible legal troubles. But the 27 EU nations are divided over whether to put in place an immediate and full ban on Russian fuels. Leaders in Germany and Hungary say a full embargo would badly harm their economies. The EU gets 40% of its gas from Russia. A nonprofit group recently announced an effort to get movie and television writers to use climate change more often in their stories and productions. The group Good Energy is a not-for-profit advising organization. It recently announced the release of Good Energy, a playbook for screenwriting in the age of climate change. Good Energy found 
Although many Hollywood stars talk about the issue, climate change-related words are not used a lot in movies. The group helped financially support research of words used in American films and television shows. Researchers looked at the words or transcripts used in 37,453 films and TV shows from 2016 to 2020. They found that 2.8% of fiction films used words related to climate change. The transcript research was carried out by the Norman Lear Center's Media Impact Project at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Part of the study has not been released. Researchers looked for links to 36 words and phrases like climate change in TV shows and films released in the United States. Anna Jane Joyner is the head writer of the playbook and founder of Good Energy. She said the playbook was created with advice from more than 100 film and television writers. She said it was a problem that writers were linking climate stories with disaster. She said the main purpose of the playbook is to expand the possibilities for writers to show how climate change would show up in real life. Joyner said her group is asking writers and industry leaders to consider stories that are less disaster-related. She said they also should include examples and resources. Joyner said the group's website has a spectrum with everything from the effects of climate change to possible answers. As an example, she said, Movies could include shots showing solar panels on the outside of a building. Casually talking about climate change can also be effective, she said. Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Sierra Club, and the Walton Family Foundation are among those providing financial support for the project. Dorothy Fortenberry is a TV writer. She wrote The Handmaid's Tale. She said the industry needs to write about different kinds of people, not just different subjects. Climate change is something that right now is affecting people who aren't necessarily the people that Hollywood tends to write stories about. It's affecting farmers in Bangladesh, farmers in Peru, farmers in Kentucky, Fortenberry said. She added that if writers told stories about different kinds of people, there would be chances to easily include climate change. Joyner says she has worked on communications related to climate change in different industries for 15 years. She said for the first 10 years, it felt like screaming into the void because nobody answered. But there is evidence of increasing concern among Americans about climate change, she said. That includes those in Hollywood. We've all gone through a kind of awakening, she said. There are a number of documentaries, films based on true events, and news programs about climate change, she said. She expressed hope that fiction creators will make progress. I'm Dan Friedel. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question from Maud, a reader of our website. Could you please explain to me the difference between with and within? Thank you. Maud. Dear Maud, 
thanks for asking this question. With and within are both prepositions. Prepositions describe a relationship to an area, place, or time between two nouns. Let us start with with. With has several different uses, and depending on what the situation is, the meaning can change a bit. The first use of with means together. I went to the cafe with my friends. In this sentence, I did not go to the cafe alone. My friends and I went together. The second use of with describes a close relationship between two nouns, and it means along, nearby, or among. Does that hat go with this shirt? In this question, the person is asking if the hat and the shirt go along together or match. And a final use of with means being in opposition or against something. She had a fight with her sister. We can see in this sentence that the sisters are having a fight or argument. They are against each other. And now for within. Within is also a preposition and is a combination of with and in. There are two uses of within. The first use means a period of time. For example, we can say, The winner of the contest should answer within two days. This sentence means that the winner has two days to answer back and no more than two days. The last meaning of within describes a relationship between two nouns in an area, space, or limit. It can mean inside of. There are many organs within the body. This sentence means that inside the body, there are a lot of organs. The store is within walking distance of my apartment. This sentence means that the store is close or nearby to my apartment, so I can walk to it. Please let us know if these examples have helped you. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlow. Now, the special English program, American Story. Many years ago, a young man named Giovanni Guasconti left his home in Naples to study in northern Italy. He took a room in an old house next to a magnificent garden filled with strange flowers and other plants. The garden belonged to a doctor, Giacomo Rappaccini. He lived with his daughter Beatrice in a small brown house in the garden. From a window in his room, Giovanni had seen that Rappaccini's daughter was very beautiful. But everyone in Padua was afraid of her father. Pietro Baglioni, a professor at the university, warned Giovanni about the mysterious Dr. Rappaccini. He is a great scientist, Professor Baglioni told the young man, but he is also dangerous. Rappaccini cares more about science than he does about people. He has created many terrible poisons from the plants in his garden. One day, Giovanni found a secret entrance to Rappaccini's garden. He went in. The plants all seemed wild and unnatural. Giovanni realized that Rappaccini must have created these strange and terrible flowers 
through his experiments. Suddenly, Rappaccini's daughter came into the garden. She moved quickly among the flowers until she reached him. Giovanni apologized for coming into the garden without an invitation, but Beatrice smiled at him and made him feel welcome. I see you love flowers, she said, and so you have come to take a closer look at my father's rare collection. While she spoke, Giovanni noticed a perfume in the air around her. He wasn't sure if this wonderful smell came from the flowers or from her breath. She asked him about his home and his family. She told him she had spent her life in this garden. Giovanni felt as if he were talking to a very small child. Her spirit sparkled like clear water. They walked slowly through the garden as they talked. At last, they reached a beautiful plant that was covered with large purple flowers. He realized that the perfume from those flowers was like the perfume of Beatrice's breath but much stronger. The young man reached out to break off one of the purple flowers, but Beatrice gave a scream that went through his heart like a knife. She caught his hand and pulled it away from the plant with all her strength. Don't ever touch those flowers, she cried. They will take your life. Hiding her face, she ran into the house. Then Giovanni saw Dr. Rappuccini standing in the garden. That night, Giovanni could not stop thinking about how sweet and beautiful Beatrice was. Finally, he fell asleep. But when the morning came, he woke up in great pain. He felt as if one of his hands was on fire. It was the hand that Beatrice had grabbed in hers when he had reached for one of the purple flowers. Giovanni looked down at his hand. There was a purple mark on it that looked like four small fingers and a little thumb. But because his heart was full of Beatrice... Giovanni forgot about the pain in his hand. He began to meet her in the garden every day. At last, she told him that she loved him, but she would never let him kiss her or even hold her hand. One morning, several weeks later, Professor Baglioni visited Giovanni. I was worried about you, the older man said. You have not come to your classes at the university for more than a month. Is something wrong? Giovanni was not pleased to see his old friend. No, nothing is wrong. I am fine, thank you. He wanted Professor Baglioni to leave, but the old man took off his hat and sat down. My dear Giovanni, he said, you must stay away from Rappuccini and his daughter. Her father has given her poison from the time she was a baby. The poison is in her blood and on her breath. If Rappuccini did this to his own daughter... What is he planning to do to you? Giovanni covered his face with his hands. Oh, my God, he cried. Don't worry, the old man continued. It is not too late to save you, and we may succeed in helping Beatrice, too. Do you see this little silver bottle? It holds a medicine 
that will destroy even the most powerful poison. Give it to your Beatrice to drink. Professor Baglioni put the little bottle on the table and left Giovanni's room. The young man wanted to believe that Beatrice was a sweet and innocent girl, and yet Professor Baglioni's words had put doubts in his heart. It was nearly time for his daily meeting with Beatrice. As Giovanni combed his hair, he looked at himself in a mirror near his bed. He could not help noticing how handsome he was. His eyes looked particularly bright, and his face had a healthy, warm glow. He said to himself, At least her poison has not gotten into my body yet. As he spoke, he happened to look at some flowers he had just bought that morning. A shock of horror went through his body. The flowers were turning brown. Giovanni's face became very white as he stared at himself in the mirror. Then he noticed a spider crawling near his window. He bent over the insect and blew a breath of air at it. The spider trembled and fell dead. I am cursed, Giovanni whispered to himself. My own breath is poison. At that moment, a rich, sweet voice came floating up from the garden. Giovanni, you are late. Come down. You are a monster, Giovanni shouted as soon as he reached her. And with your poison, you have made me into a monster, too. I am a prisoner of this garden. Giovanni... Beatrice cried, looking at him with her large, bright eyes. Why are you saying these terrible things? It is true that I can never leave this garden, but you are free to go wherever you wish. Giovanni looked at her with hate in his eyes. Don't pretend that you don't know what you've done to me. A group of insects had flown into the garden. They came toward Giovanni and flew around his head. He blew his breath at them. The insects fell to the ground dead. Beatrice screamed, I see it! I see it! My father's science has done this to us. Believe me, Giovanni, I did not ask him to do this to you. I only wanted to love you. Giovanni's anger changed to sadness. Then he remembered the medicine that Professor Baglioni had given him. Perhaps the medicine would destroy the poison in their bodies and help them to become normal again. Dear Beatrice, he said, our fate is not so terrible. He showed her the little silver bottle and told her what the medicine inside it might do. I will drink first, she said. You must wait to see what happens to me before you drink it. She put Baglioni's medicine to her lips and took a small sip. At the same moment, Rappuccini came out of his house and walked slowly toward the two young people. He spread his hands out to them as if he were giving them a blessing. My daughter, he said, you are no longer alone in the world. Give Giovanni one of the purple flowers from your favorite plant. It will not hurt him now. My science and your love have made him different from ordinary men. My father, Beatrice said weakly, why did you do this terrible thing to your own child? Rappuccini looked surprised. What do you mean, my daughter? He asked. You have power no other woman has. 
You can defeat your strongest enemy with only your breath. Would you rather be a weak woman? I want to be loved, not feared, Beatrice replied. But now it does not matter. I am leaving you, father. I am going where the poison you have given me will do no harm. Goodbye to you, Giovanni. Beatrice dropped to the ground. She died at the feet of her father and Giovanni. The poison had been too much a part of the young woman. The medicine that destroyed the poison destroyed her as well. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 